The U.S. government has imposed strict travel restrictions on Iranian President Hassan Rouhani, who is in New York for the U.N. General Assembly. Under the restrictions, Rouhani cannot move far from the U.N. headquarters on the eastern side of Manhattan Island. However, Washington has granted him special authorization to stay at a hotel. A U.N. official says the U.S. has in the past imposed similar limitations for us, including the late Fidel Castro of Cuba, who were not in good terms with Washington. The same restrictions have been imposed on staff of the Iranian mission to the United Nations since July. The U.S. also delayed issuing visas for Rouhani and other Iranian officials to attend the event. The visa denial would have been a violation of the U.N. headquarters agreement. Meanwhile, Russia's foreign ministry says the U.S. has denied visas to several members of the Russian delegation to the U.N. General Assembly. The ministry called the move a violation of Washington's international commitments. The ministry also dismissed as untenable the U.S. references to technical reasons for denying visa to the delegation. Russian media cited the ministry's spokeswoman, Maria Zakharova, as saying the issue would be a central topic in a meeting between Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov and the U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo in New York. The media also says that Russia has issued a protest to a U.S. Embassy in Moscow. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome to the United Nations His Excellency Mikhail Aoun, President of the Lebanese Republic, and we invite him to address the General Assembly. Michelle. and the refugees are being turned into hostages in an international game to be uh, used in future settlements. De facto, this may drive them, foster the, which is threatening the very existence of the country. We are in the best position to know the problems um, that displaced people's experience. Our country has had very many experiences in this regard. The first was in 1974, after the outbreak of the war in Cyprus, with the arrival of a large number of Cypriots in Lebanon. And then they swiftly returned to their country as soon as the ceasefire was declared without waiting for the political solution which has still not been achieved today. Uh, the, uh, but our experience began in 1948 with the waves of displacement of the Palestinian people to the uh, neighboring countries and particularly Lebanon. And today, Palestinians are still living in camps, awaiting their return and awaiting the a political solution and the implementation of Resolution 194. And they've been waiting for more than seven decades now. And in this context, I would like to guard against the danger of reducing the services provided by UNRWA to the Palestinian refugees. This adds social and fiscal strains, and the effects are being felt in Lebanon. Uh, the pa Palestinian youth should become education candidates, not revenge candidates. So I would warn against any attempt to undermine or change UNRWA's mandate, and I call on the contributing countries to the budget of UNRWA to double their contributions in order to enable it to maintain its vital role. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, the Middle East crisis has been continuing now for decades and is becoming more complicated because all the approaches to a solution and all of the Israeli practices are in contradiction with the founding principles of the United Nations. Indeed, the Judaization of Jerusalem and the meth methodic colonial policy and legislation that contradicts human rights and the recognition of the annexation of lands that were occupied by force 
as in the case of the Golan Heights, and also the electoral promises to annex new lands, and with all uh, the leaks about the deal of the century, uh, threatens the territorial unity of the country. in order to put an end to the Palestinian issue and keep the Palestinians where they are. Lebanon will suffer the effects of this because we host a large number of the refugees. And all of this undermines any chance for peace in the Middle East and points undoubtedly to a dark unknown future. However, the rights of peoples remain even when so much time passes by. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, the Israeli violations of Resolution 1701 have never ceased. And neither have the uh, aggressions against Lebanese sovereignty by land, sea and air. The uh, hostile act carried out last month against a residential area in the heart of Beirut is the most serious infringement of this resolution. Moreover, the fires that lasted for days in the occupied Shaba farms as a result of the incendiary Israeli shells represent an international environmental crime that requires condemnation of those who caused them. From this rostrum I reiterate that Lebanon is a peace-loving country. We are committed to respecting Resolution 1701 and we always strive to respect it. Yet this commitment does not eliminate our natural non-transferable right to legitimately defend ourselves in order to defend our land and our people with all available means. I also reaffirm here that Lebanon is strongly attached to its sovereign, sovereign rights over the occupied Shaba farms, the Kafar Shuba hills and the northern Gajar, occupied by Israel. We will sh spare no opportunity to establish the internationally recognized land border as recognized by the United Nations and we will do our best to demarcate our maritime borders as well under UN supervision. Any contribution in this regard is welcome, particularly since Lebanon is going to uh, begin exploratory oil and gas drilling operations in our territorial waters by the end of the year and in accordance with international laws and norms. Mr. President, ladies and gentlemen, as Lebanon embarks on the preparations to celebrate the centenary of Greater Lebanon, you will be celebrating the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, which was founded on the 24th of October 1945. Ever since, the world has known many wars and conflicts, especially in the Middle East, the constant flashpoint on the planet, where temperature rises or drops but never cools down. And it is our peoples who continue to pay the high price, sacrificing their security, stability, their peace, their economy, and even their demographic diversity. Indeed, the core of the problem is the same. It hasn't changed. Namely, the contradiction between the interests of the strong and the right of the weak. Thus principles, logic and justice are lost and solutions are diluted. This aberration prevailing in politics today has cost the world its stability. Indeed, all parameters have been undermined and there are no more any criteria to stem or control differences 
and thus solve issues according to applicable rules. So people are no longer able to converge and cooperate together to find political solutions beyond their borders. All opportunities for resolving conflicts have been lost and this has opened the door wide for chaos. The United Nations has undertaken many initiatives in order to um, make the voice of peace and development heard. Some of them have succeeded while many did not reach the desired outcome. We hope today that the United Nations will promote its general principles, international law and the charters as they are the only reference to safeguard our rights. Indeed, no justice can be established, no right can be consecrated, no peace can be established as long as the principle prevailing in our world is I am strong, therefore I am right. Thank you for your attention. And traffic in monstrous anti-Semitism. Last year, the country's supreme leader stated Israel is a malignant cancerous tumor that has to be removed and eradicated. It is possible, and it will happen. America will never tolerate such anti-Semitic hate. Fanatics have long used hatred of Israel to distract from their own failures. Thankfully, there is a growing recognition in the wider Middle East that the countries of the region share common interests in battling extremism and unleashing economic opportunity. That is why it is so important to have full, normalized relations between Israel and its neighbors. Only a relationship built on common interests, mutual respect, and religious tolerance can forge a better future. Iran citizens deserve a government that cares about reducing poverty, ending corruption, and increasing jobs, not st The Assembly will hear an address by His Majesty King Abdullah ibn al Hussein, King of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. His Highness, I'm sorry, His Highness, thank you. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome to the United Nations His Highness, His Majesty King Abdullah ibn al Hussein, King of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan, and invite him to address the Assembly. Your Highness, you have the floor. Bismillahir Rahman Rahim. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary General, Your Excellencies, this week leaders from around the world will stand before you here in this great General Assembly Hall to take part in the 2019 General Debate. We come here in recognition of a simple reality. This General Assembly is vital to meet the dangers and seize the opportunities of our world. Collective action, this is the promise of the United Nations. Nearly 75 years ago, this organization was created by the specific individual actions of member countries coming together to shape a better future. And today we still urgently need each and every member country to act and to act together with our global neighbors and achieve the better, safer world all of us need. My friends, collective action is also vital for ending bitter crises and conflicts. And no crisis has done more global damage than the core conflict in my region, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Neither side has achieved the durable peace that 
a secure future depends on. And regional and world stability has continued to pay the price. It is a terrible irony that the land holy to three faiths, faiths which share the great commandment to love one's neighbor, should ever be a place of conflict. This is the land where prophets walked, the land where generations of Muslims, Christians, and Jews have sought to live in obedience to God, teaching their children compassion, mercy, and respect for others. Segregation, forced displacement, violence, and mistrust do not belong in this holy land. Forty years ago, my father, his late majesty, King Hussein, who loved peace, stood in his very chamber and decried the occupation and attempts, in his words, to eradicate from the world's memory centuries of history and tradition and spiritual, moral, and cultural ideals. It is a global moral tragedy that the occupation continues. But no occupation, no displacements, no acts of force can erase people's history, hopes, or rights, or change the true heritage of our shared values among the three monolithic faiths. And nothing can take away the international rights of the Palestinian people to equality, justice, and self-determination. My friends, my friends, young people ask me, why does not the world stand up for Palestinian rights? Isn't it time to answer them by showing that global justice and human rights belong to them too? And it begins with respect for the holy sites and rejecting all attempts to alter the legal status of East Jerusalem and the authentic historic character of the holy city Jerusalem. What lessons do we teach young people when armed personnel enter Al-Aqsa Mosque al-Haram al-Sharif, even as Muslim worshippers gather to pray. As a Hashemite custodian, I am bound by a special duty to protect Jerusalem's Islamic and Christian holy sites. But all of us have a stake and a moral obligation to uphold religious freedom and human rights. So let us safeguard the holy city for all humanity as a unifying city of peace. And we must also press forward towards an end to the conflict and a just, lasting, and durable peace through realization of the two-state solution, a solution that is in accord with international law and UN resolutions which provides an end to the conflict and creates a viable, independent, sovereign Palestinian state on the June 4, 1967 lines with East Jerusalem as its capital, living side by side with Israel in mutual peace and security. The two-state solution is the only genuine solution. Because what is the alternative? One state, segregated, with unequal laws, dependent on force, betraying the deepest values of the good people on both sides, that is a formula for enduring conflict, not a path to stability, security, and peace. My friends, tolerance, compassion, and the equality of all human beings, these are the values that make global harmony and collective action possible. And these are the values that permeate the UN Charter. To live together in peace as good neighbors, to honor the rights and equality of all, to combine our efforts and unite our strengths, not only to maintain peace and security, but improve human life through justice, prosperity, and greater hope for humanity. These are the moral obligations that the UN founders set forth. Now they are our responsibility, and we must not fail. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace and God's blessings and mercy be upon you. On behalf of the General Assembly, 
I wish to thank the king of the Hashemite kingdom of Jordan. Esteemed delegates, today the Palestinian territory under, under Israeli occupation have become one of the most striking places of injustice. If the images of an innocent Palestinian woman who was murdered heinously by Israeli security forces on the street just a few days ago will not awake the global conscience, then we are standing at a point where words are not sufficient. I'm quite curious. What about this map of Israel? Where is Israel? Where does the land of Israel begin and end? Look at this map. Where was Israel in 1947? And where is Israel now? Especially between the years 1949 and 1967. Where was Israel and where is Israel now? Look, this is 1947, the land of Palestine. There is seemingly almost no Israeli presence on these lands. The entire territory belongs to the Palestinians, so the map suggests. But the year 1947, the uh, distribution plan takes place, gets ratified, Palestine, Palestinian lands start shrinking, and Israel starts expanding. And from 1947 to 1967, 1967, Israel is still expanding, Palestine is still shrinking. And today, the current situation, there is seemingly no Palestinian presence, the entire land belongs to Israel. But would it suffice Israel? No. Israel is still willing to take over the remaining of the land, but what about the United Nations Security Council? What about the United Nations? And what about the resolutions therein? Are those resolutions being activated? Are they being implemented and enforced? No. So we have to ask ourselves, what does the UN serve? Under this roof, we are producing resolutions without any effect. So when do you think, or where do you think justice can prevail? This is our main suffering. This is where the pain is coming from. The current Israeli government and the administration, right next to these murders and atrocities, is busy with intervening and attacking the historical legal status of Jerusalem and holy sacred lands and artifacts. As Turkey, we have a very clear stance on this issue. The immediate establishment of an independent Palestinian state with homogenous territories on the basis of the 1967 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital is the only solution. Any other peace plan other than this will never have a chance of being fair, just, and it will never be implemented. Now, I'm asking from the rostrum of the United Nations General Assembly, where are the borders of the State of Israel? Is it the 1947 borders? The 1967 borders? Or is there another border that we need to know of? How can the Golan Heights and the West Bank settlements be seized, just like other occupied Palestinian territories before the eyes of the world, if they still are not within the official borders of this state? Is the aim of the initiative promoted as the deal of the century to entirely eliminate the presence of the state and the people of Palestine? Do you want another bloodshed? All actors of the international community, in particular the UN, should provide concrete support to the Palestinian people beyond more promises. In this regard, it's very important for the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian refugees in the Near East to continue its activities effectively. Turkey will continue to stand by the oppressed people of Palestine as she has always been done.
on behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome to the United Nations His Excellency Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, President of the Arab Republic of Egypt. and to invite him to address the assembly. I thank you, Mr. President. In the name of God, Mr. President, Mr. President. The resolution of protracted crises and inherited ones is a necessary precondition for any serious efforts aimed at formulating a more effective international system. The most prominent example of this is the longest standing crisis in the Middle East, namely the Palestinian cause. The persistence of this cause without a just solution based on international resolutions calling for the establishment of an independent Palestinian state with East Jerusalem as its capital does not only mean the continuation of the plight of the Palestinian people, but it also entails the continued depletion of the resources of the peoples of the Middle East. And I reiterate with a clear conscience what I've stated from this podium over the past few years. I say that Arabs are open to the realization of a just and comprehensive peace. The Arab Peace Initiative is still on the table, and there remains an opportunity to launch a new phase in the Middle East. However, we need bold decisions that restore the rights to the Palestinians that pave the way for a major change in the reality of this region. And I say this without exaggeration. In the entire world, these decisions would lead to the establishment of a security and economic system in the Middle East that is based on peace, security, cooperation, and common interest. Mr. President, the adoption of comprehensive solutions to address the root causes of international problems is imperative for the success of the multilateral system. The Assembly will now hear an address by His Excellency Evo Morales Aime, Constitutional President of the Plurinational State of Bolivia. I request protocol to escort His Excellency. On behalf of the General Assembly, I have the honor to welcome to the United Nations His Excellency Evo Morales Aime and to invite him to address the Assembly. Excellency. Thank you. I'd like to extend my greetings to my brother. President of the General Assembly of the United Nations, Tijani Mohamed Bande, Brother Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, brothers and sisters, presidents, chancellors, delegates, brothers and sisters, international organizations, and all the peoples of the world as a result of unilateral measures taken by some states states that have decided to ignore commitments, good faith, and global structures that were built in order for states to live healthily with each other in the context of international law and based on the basic principles of the United Nations Charter. We meet in this forum to debate and to seek solutions to the great and serious threats to mankind and life on this planet. Our house, Mother Earth, is our only home, and it is irreplaceable. Increasingly, it is suffering from more fires, more floods, hurricanes, earth earthquakes, droughts, and other disasters. Every year, is hotter than the one before, more ice is melting, sea level is increasing, and every day we see the disappearance 
of species suffer from land erosion, desertification, and deforestation. Brothers and sisters, and peoples of the world, the arms race, military spending, technology used in the service of death, unscrupulous arms trade, all have been on the rise. The financial system continues to be anti-democratic, inequitable, and unstable. The system continues to privilege tax havens and banking secrecy, forcing the weaker countries to accept conditions that only perpetuate their dependency. We observe with sadness that the huge social asymmetries continue to exist. According to Oxfam information, currently 1.3 billion people live in poverty, whereas 1% of the wealthiest on the planet hold 82% of world wealth in the year 2017. Inequality, hunger, poverty, the migratory crisis, epidemics of disease, unemployment, these are not just local problems, these are global problems. Transnational corporations control food, they control water, they control non-renewable resources, arms, and technology. These corporations control our personal data and are trying to turn everything into a business in order to accumulate more capital. The world is controlled by a global oligarchy where a handful of multimillionaires define the political destiny of mankind and economic destiny. 26 people have the same amount of wealth as 3.8 billion people. This is an insult. It's immoral and it's unacceptable. The problem ultimately lies in the model of production and consumption in ownership of natural resources and the inequitable distribution of wealth. Let us speak plainly and let us speak clearly. The root of the problem lies in capitalism, the capitalist system. And this is why the United Nations are more relevant and important than ever, despite individual efforts to undermine it, which ha these efforts have been insufficient. And it's only through joint action.